We're very much excited to see the kinds of changes that have taken place in mesothelioma therapy. And uh, what I will do today is I will update uh, the results of the systemic therapy and the clinical trials and the agents that are coming into clinic in the 2017, 2018, and the 21st century. So as we know, mesothelioma is an aggressive cancer. It's a difficult cancer not only to treat, but also to diagnose. Uh, the diagnosis is made by histopathology. Uh, however, mesothelioma can be confused with adenocarcinoma, and uh, the gold standard can be either the um, electron microscopy or the immunohistochemistry biomarkers. And the important biomarkers that we'll look at are cytokeratin 5 and 6. It has to be positive, uh, colretinin positive, WT positive, CEA negative, and TTF negative. Uh, there has been uh, a lot of interest in uh, the genes, and we're going to have a whole talk in the second part of our session. But briefly, uh, mesothelioma occurs in a minority of patients exposed to asbestos. And there has been uh, a question whether there is a genetic predisposition to mesothelioma. So there have been uh, the germline mutations have been identified in the BAP1 uh, gene, which is a tumor suppressor gene, which can predispose to familial and sporadic mesothelioma. So uh, one of the trials that was presented at ASCO today was NCI mesothelioma natural history uh, protocol. Uh, the, this is the data that was presented by Dr. Rafid Hassan, where they took, um, their goal was to identify the profile of DNA repair genes that predispose to mesothelioma. They enrolled all comers. They had 241 consecutive patients, and they sequenced their germline DNA and identified mutations in all classes of genes and in 73 DNA repair genes. So what they saw is that uh, 30 of the patients, or 12%, carried a pathogenic germline mutation in a DNA repair gene. And most of the mutations were seen in the BAP1 gene. Uh, there were other genes that were important, CHEC2, PLB2, and then the genes that are the BRCA2 was part of it, MLH, POT1, TP53, and MRE11A. So what was also interesting is the tumors from all the 12 patients with germline BAP mutations carried a second somatic event that led uh, to the complete loss of the BAP1 function. And what was even more interesting is when they looked at the survivals is that patients with the germline mutations had a much better overall survival than patients without the mutations. So median survival was 7.9 versus 2.1 years. So their conclusion was that the germline uh, mutation testing should be considered in all patients. And even more interestingly, patients with germline mutations may benefit from PARP inhibitor because this incorporates the concept of synthetic lethality where two genes are taken out and not working. So they're looking at the Olaparib, um, which is a PARP inhibitor that is currently in the clinic for in uh, use in mesothelioma. So now we're going to switch gears, and very briefly, we will review our chemotherapy uh, trials, and then we will look at all the new data. So as we know, the first big trial was in 2003. There were actually two trials that demonstrated that combination chemotherapy, pemetrexid or ralitrexid, increases survival compared to single agents. Uh, both trials showed significant response rates and increase in progression-free survival and overall survival. And as you have seen from the previous talk, the overall survival in the combination group was 12 months, and it was 9.3 months in the single agent group. So in 2004, that was a big breakthrough, and that was established as the standard of care. Two questions came out um, of these trials. Can cisplatinum, can carboplatinum be substituted for cisplatinum because, as we know, it's a much easier drug to tolerate? And the answer to that question was yes. Carboplatinum can be substituted. There is a pretty similar response rate and similar survival if carboplatinum is substituted. 
Uh, the next question, which hasn't been answered yet, is what is the role of maintenance, maintenance as we use in lung cancer? And that trial um, has been closed, but has not been uh, analyzed. So the uh, role of maintenance is still uh, to be determined. So uh, there have been, this is now the uh, new era of uh, therapy in mesothelioma. So the first drug uh, that was added and was investigated in mesothelioma was bevacizumab or, um, anti or angiogenic drug. So we know that VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor is a potent mitogen for vascular endothelium and it may be a key regulator in mesothelioma. So this is the VEGF, and we know that patients with uh, mesothelioma have very high levels of uh, VEGF in the blood. So bevacizumab is a monoclonal antibody uh, that blocks, uh, that binds to uh, VEGF and blocks its effect on the uh, endothelium. So this was the MAPS trial that Dr. Cameron referred to. This was done by the French group that uh, this trial is called MAPS-1. This was a very large phase three trial that, uh, was, uh, that took all patients. They had all histologies, epithelioid, sarcomatoid, and mixed. And uh, they gave uh, patients the standard of care chemotherapy, which was pemetrexate isinsplatinum. And the other group got pemetrexate cisplatinum and bevacizumab. They treated them for six cycles. And then patients that had stable disease were given either placebo or were given bevacizumab and were treated until progression. And what we saw uh, is we saw uh, a big difference in progression-free survival, 9.6 versus 7.5 months. And additionally, uh, we saw a difference in overall survival, 18.8 .8 versus 16.1 months in uh, patients uh, that did not get uh, the bevacizumab. More importantly, bevacizumab was uh, beneficial uh, in all patients, all subgroup analysis. Uh, in subgroup analysis, all patients benefited from bevacizumab, and it did not affect uh, quality of life. Quality uh, of life questionnaires that were filled out uh, were pretty similar in patients that uh, received uh, drug or did not. So the next question, um, uh, so the summary, uh, MAP summary, is that uh, because of the increase in the overall survival, the NCCN guideline in guidelines incorporated that regimen, and in all the patients that are Avastin or Bevacizumab eligible, it can be added to standard chemotherapy. And um, this is what most of us have been using in patients that can receive Bevacizumab. So the next step and the next drug uh, is, uh, that uh, was investigated is called nantandinib. Nantandinib is a triple angiokinase inhibitor, or TKI, and it inhibits not only the VEGF, it actually inhibits the VEGF receptor, but also the fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor receptor and platelet growth factor receptor. In vivo, um, it showed good activity uh, in animals, and it also inhabited, inhabited cell growth. So this was another phase two trial uh, that was presented originally in 2016. Uh, an intendinib was added to frontline chemotherapy, again to cisplatinum and pemetrexid every 21 days. For six cycles, patients were treated, uh, and if they had stable disease, they went on to receive nintendinib um, maintenance or placebo alone. And this is the waterfall plot uh, that you can see. The overall response rate in the nintendinib arm was 56%, and the overall response rate in the placebo arm was 44%. Median duration of response was six months in the experimental group and four months in the placebo. And here we'll look uh, at the progression-free survival and overall survival curves. This is the progression-free survival curve um, for uh, nintendinib, and this is the overall survival. And as you can see, uh, it was 9.4 months versus 5.7 months and for progression-free survival in 18.3 months and 14.2 months for overall survival. What they were also able to show 
that epithelioid patients did much better. This is the curve for progression-free survival for epithelioid patients, and this is their overall survival. So um, the conclusion was is that epithelioid patients uh, have done better, and there may be some dosing flexibility, and this may be a preferred drug. So right now there is a very large Lume Meso trial uh, that is on the way. It completed accrual, and we should have results uh, later in the year for this trial. So let's look, uh, let's compare the two angiogenics uh, that uh, we have and the two trials. In the Nintendinib trial, there were no sarcomatoid patients. There were 11% biphasic patients. And in the Bevacizumab trial, which was a much bigger trial, there were 20% sarcomatoids. The response rate was 57% and not reported in the Bevacizumab trial. This was a personal communication. And the progression-free survival is in the order of nine months, and the overall survival is in the order of 18 months. And again, if we compare this with uh, chemotherapy and historical controls, the, uh, the survival rate was 12 months. Now, if we we'll look at the toxicity, the toxicity profile is quite different. In the bevacizumab arm, we see what we're used to. We see the most of this toxicity comes from hypertension and cardiovascular events. On the other hand, in the TKI uh, trial, diarrhea and proteinuria were significantly more important, as well as LFT elevations. Uh, there were no treatment-related deaths in the uh, nintendinib arm. So what can we conclude? Uh, again, patients with mesothelioma have high growth, fac growth factor levels of VEGF. Unfortunately, no biomarker is available to date to see which patients would benefit. We don't know what the survival benefit comes from. Does it come from the maintenance and just longer treatment? And would the maintenance with pemetrexate or pemetrexate plus angiogenic give us the same results? And of course, the toxicity profiles are different and we have to be careful with our patients. So uh, what is next? Um, we're going to talk about salvage uh, therapies in mesothelioma. Uh, this, is a very, this is a very rare disease, unfortunately very aggressive disease. And um, there has been a lot of investigation going on uh, because there is really nothing that is FDA approved in second line. The response rates are not great in second line therapy. So uh, we're investigating many options. The current choices that we have are uh, chemotherapy agents, pemetrexate, gemcitabine, veneralbine. And now, um, and this has been new in the past couple of years, the immunotherapy drugs, uh, nivolumab and nipilumumab, pembrolizumab, have made their way into the second line um, arena. So uh, we're going to look today at uh, immunotherapies or immune checkpoint inhibitors because these drugs inhibit important um, parts of the cell cycle, and these are the drugs that we're going to the drugs in red uh, are the drugs that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about a very different drug uh, that focuses on arginine metabolism um, as well. So just to remind you very quickly and to echo Dr. Cameron's talk, as we know that uh, tumor cells secrete antigens. Uh, these anti antigens are uh, formed into peptides and are incorporated into the dendritic cell. Uh, subsequently, dendritic cell presents uh, the antigen to uh, the activated C T cell, and these are the cells of the um, immune system. So we're going to focus on the part of the presentation of the dendritic cell to the T cell. And T cells recognize antigens presented by the dendritic cells when it is coupled with major histocompatibility complex through the T cell receptors. T cells generate an immune response by stimulating to the, um, by binding to the B7 receptor that is on the dendritic cell. And as you can see, this causes the activation of the T cells or of the cytotoxic T cells. To avoid the overactivation of the immune system, there is another compound that is called CTLA-4 that is generated on the surface of the T cell. And this compound and this process uh, stops the uh, activation of the T cells in order to prevent autoimmunity. 
So the first antibody and the first immunotherapy drug was developed was the CTLA antibody uh, that would block this particular interaction and would allow the immune system to go on uh, without putting the break on it. So uh, there is a second part uh, after the cells have been activated, and the second part takes in the tumor microenvironment once the T cell is also activated. Uh, there is another, um, there is another um, a receptor, which is called PD-1, that is present on the T cell that is also an inhibitory uh, receptor. Tumors have co-opted uh, this process, and they have a ligand on the surface called PDL1, and that again inactivates the immune system. So the major immune oncology drugs uh, that have been developed focus on this part. They block the PD1 interaction and the PDL1 interaction. So this has been kind of the concept of uh, the immunotherapies. So these are the immunotherapies that we're going to discuss today. We will discuss the two um, anti-CTLA-4 antibodies. We will discuss anti-PD-1 antibodies and anti pd one antibodies. So the very first trial uh, that was done was done with CTLA-4 antibodies. Uh, it was a very large trial. It was a phase two. We participated in that trial and actually put quite a few patients on, 557. Uh, 571 patients after uh, first or second line uh, therapy uh, were given either tremolumumab, CTLA-4 antibody, or placebo. And unfortunately, as you can see, there was absolutely no difference in the overall survival. And there were quite a bit more um, grade three adverse events in the immunotherapy arm. So this was taken further, and this is the study of pembrolizumab. Uh, this was um, a part of the Keynote uh, 028 study. Uh, this was a, a phase 1b trial where they looked at 25 patients from 13 centers. Patients were selected for the pdl one expression, and pembrolizumab was given in 10 milligrams per kilo, uh, Q2 weeks, for up to two years. This is the waterfall plot. Uh, they had a 20% response rate, um, and responses were durable. And if you look at the swimmer's plot, the average response rate was approximately 12 months. They had no treatment-related deaths in the study and had uh, minimal um, adverse immune effects. So this is another study of pembrolizumab, which was uh, published, uh, which was actually presented uh, by the University of Chicago group. This was a little bit bigger trial, 64 patients. They had a different dose of pembrolizumab, 200 milligrams IV every three weeks, so not as much. Uh, very similar response rate, partial response is 19%, stable disease 47%. They had a 64% uh, disease control rate. Median progression-free survival, 4.5 months, with a median overall survival of 11.5 months. And uh, what they have done in this uh, trial, they have broken it down by histology. And we can see that the sarcomatoid patients uh, had a much higher response rate, 40%. They have also uh, broken it down by the PDL expression, and we see that uh, patients that had no PDL expression still had some responses, but the highest response rate was seen in the high expressors, and this was also correlated with an overall survival at one year. So this was uh, this is a PDL1 uh, antibody called avolumab. Uh, this is a little bit of a different trial. Patients were quite a bit more heavily pretreated. They took all comers, and these patients were unselected for the PDL1 status. They were treated uh, with avolumab, and again, they had in this trial they had one complete response, 7.5% partial responses, 26% stable disease. Uh, progressive disease was seen in 34% um, of the patients with an overall response rate of about 10%. Uh, and finally, this is nivolumab. Uh, this was presented um, in 2016 by Dr. Paul Bass, 34 patients. And here, uh, they had a partial response in 24%, stable disease in 26 
But again, what was interesting about this trial, out of the eight patients that had partial response, six had no PDL1 expression. Um, so this is something that we always have to keep in mind. So if we uh, look at all of the trials together and uh, we'll look at all the different agents, we're going to have two pembrolizumab trial, one nivolumab, and one um, volumab trial. We can see that overall response rate is in the order of 20%, and, and progression-free survival is between 3.5 and 6 months. So what can we conclude from these trials? Uh, data derived from very small, non-randomized trials. The response rate is about 10 to 20 percent. Uh, responses are seen in both epithelioid and sarcomatoid patients, and responses are also seen also in both in PDL1 positive and PDL1 negative patients. So what is the next step? Uh, we would like to get a better response, so we'd like to combine the two agents, uh, the interaction at the dendritic cell and the tumor and the T cell and the cancer cell and the T cell. And these are, again, the agents that are available to us. So the first uh, trial that we have was of tremolumumab and durvalumab. It was presented by Dr. Calabaro that spoke at this symposium last year. Uh, this trial was done in Italy, 40 patients, um, first or second line treatment, and they received a combination of tremolulumab uh, and durvalumab. And this was, again, if the patients did not progress and had stable disease, this was followed by maintenance durvalumab. Uh, their primary objective was immune-mediated immune response, uh, but they also looked at overall survival and PDL expression. And what they were able to show is that uh, their response rate was a little bit higher. It was 28%. Disease control rate was at 65%. Similar progression-free survival and similar overall survival. Uh, what they were also showed is that the PDL1 expression did not correlate with the response rate, progression-free survival, or overall survival. So uh, then there, was, uh, there were two studies that have um, kind of also changed the course of mesothelioma. The first one is called INITIATE. Uh, it was also it was presented by uh, Dr. Paul Bass at IMEG in 2018. Uh, and this was a combination, uh, a small trial of combination of uh, ipilimumab or nivolumab, or as we like to refer to it as ipinivo. Uh, patients were uh, treated after, again, these were patients that have been treated before. They've had one or two previous lines of treatment, uh, good uh, performance status. They were given ip ip uh, ipilimumab um, every six weeks in combination with nivolumab versus nivolumab alone. Again, patients uh, were unselected for the PDL1 status, and their primary endpoint was disease control. They had partial response in 30% of the patients and stable disease in 38. So the partial response of 30% is higher than what we have seen with single agents. And of course, this gave rise uh, to the trial that is probably better known because this was a bigger trial. This was a MAPS-2 trial that was done in France. As we just heard, they're good about recruiting patients very quickly. Uh, this was done by the same group that has done the MAPS-1 trial. Uh, they had 57 patients in each group, and they were randomized, and patients received nivolumab alone or nivolumab and ipilimumab, so this was the randomized trial. They were treated um, until progression and monitored with CT scans every 12 weeks. Uh, this is the waterfall plots of the overall response rate in the single arm right here and in the combination arm. So the combination arm had a better response rate. Uh, the disease control rate was 42% uh, in the single arm and 51% in the combination arm. Uh, and what really put this trial on the map is that uh, they had better survival in the combination arm uh, versus the single agent arm. 
But unfortunately, um, there were significantly more toxicities in the combination arm. Uh, if you look at all grade toxicity, 93% in the combination arm, 88% in the nivolumab alone arm, and there were three treatment-related deaths which were related to immunotherapy uh, in the combination arm. And uh, the patient that died from kidney failure, the, this, um, the event happened 12 weeks uh, when the patient was off treatment. Uh, so um, to um, further, to take this further along, those were the immunotherapies by themselves, and they were in second line. Uh, this is a first line trial of chemotherapy combined with immunotherapy, and this is the first one of a kind. Uh, this was presented by uh, Dr. Novak, who also spoke at this symposium last year, and this was presented at ASCO uh, up in this year. So what they have done with this trial, these were first-line patients, and they've taken the regular cisplatinum and pemetrexate and combined it for the first time with immunotherapy with drivolumab, and uh, this was uh, a phase two, so uh, no placebo arm. Uh, they treated the patients for six cycles, and again, if they did not progress, they went on to receive uh, immunotherapy as maintenance, and their primary endpoint was progression-free survival. Uh, they analyzed the data were presented for the first 31 participants. This is the waterfall plot, and they had um, uh, the, um, they had very good response rates. Their overall response rate by iResist criteria was 53%. Uh, the partial responses were seen at 58% of the patients, which of course is a much higher number than what we have seen with single agents or immunotherapies alone. And they had stable disease in 29% of the patients. Uh, their progression-free survival was 7.3 months. Um, uh, they also had uh, some grade three adverse events. 65% uh, of the patients experienced adverse events. 20% uh, uh, of them were grade three to four. They had four deaths in this study. Uh, none of them were attributed to immunotherapy, but nevertheless, uh, this 13% death rate in a study is uh, a high percentage, and you have to question exactly what happened. They quantified the deaths. Uh, and again, one was to, due to progression of disease, one to aspiration pneumonia, myocardial infarction, and pulmonary embolism. So what, what can we conclude from the combination trials of immunotherapy? Uh, they're still uh, very small, and they're phase two trials, and we uh, need phase three trials to make sure that this uh, data holds up. Combinations may provide a higher response rate. It's not completely clear if they do. And uh, the high response rate comes at the price of higher toxicities. So this is uh, the, last, uh, uh, the last issue I'm going to talk about is arginine metabolism. This is a completely different approach than immunotherapy, still biologic. Uh, the metabolites have been uh, traditionally used in leukemias. So this is uh, the premise is that the arginine is, the, uh, is uh, the amino acid that is required for regular cell cycle growth and development. And as you can see, this is the arginine. Arginine can be um, obtained externally or uh, cells can make and metabolize arginine internally uh, via the urea cycle. Uh, some cancer cells do not have the enzyme, which is called arginine synthetase, and cannot make arginine internally. And these cells rely on the external arginine supply. So a medication that has been developed, which is called ADI-PEG120, is a synthetic compound that can remove arginine from the bloodstream, depleting the cells of um, the blood supply. So the arginine synthetase doesn't work in the cancer cell. They can metabolize arginine, and arginine is removed uh, from the bloodstream. So uh, it's given once a week, uh, and uh, it depletes the arginine. It also has been synergistic uh, with cisplatinum and pemetrexate. 
So uh, there was a, a clinical trial that also was originally presented at ASCO 2017, Atomic uh, Polaris trial. Uh, in that trial, which was phase one, uh, they have taken ASSI, or arginine synthetase deficient patients, and they have treated them with cisplatinum, pemetrexate, regular standard chemotherapy, and weekly um, ADI PEG-20 and uh, had very good initial responses, 35% partial response rate, disease control rate of 93%, uh, which was very exciting, uh, progression-free survival 5.6 months, overall survival of 10 months. So uh, then it was demonstrated that, this, uh, that the SSI deficient patients are mostly sarcomatoid and biphasic patients, so subsequently, the trials have been limited uh, to the sarcomatoid or biphasic patients. We're currently participating in this trial and have been recruiting quite a few patients and have seen some good responses. So uh, these are the examples of what we're looking at for mesothelioma therapy. I have discussed with you the immune checkpoint inhibitors an immune checkpoint blockade. We have also looked at anti-angiogenic therapies. We have lo looked at arginine deprivation therapy. Dr. Cameron has talked about um, the possibility of vaccines and uh, viral intrapleural therapy. And of course, there's also the mesothelin that is uh, a common marker on mesothelioma. And now the CAR cells are being investigated, the CAR T cells for mesothelioma as well. So in conclusion, uh, there have been important changes in the management of mesothelioma literally in the last few years. The role of the VEGF uh, treatment uh, has been elucidated. Immunotherapy is now coming to the forefront of our therapies uh, in combination with chemotherapy. Molecular biologic research needs to focus on biomarkers because we still don't have biomarkers and don't know which patients will benefit from which therapies. And vaccines, anti-mesothelin CAR T cells, intrapleural viral therapies are all currently under investigation. So thank you very much.